welcome to the final day of AvgradCon, and thank you for making it out this early on the final day of, well, science day of AvgradCon. Um, my name is Sam, I'm one of the organizers, and I'm going to be giving you a warm-up talk today that's kind of a crash course in biochemistry and the origins of life, uh, which, you know, I can totally cover in 30 minutes, right? Um, so, uh, completely blatantly, I have liberally borrowed slides from Aaron Goldman and Grasshopper, so uh, luckily neither of them are here, but they both know. Um, so if, if any of you were at AvgradCon last year, you may see some similar stuff. Um, Alright, so first off, I think a lot of presentations should probably have this, the why do we care slide. So this is um, goal three from the Astrobiology Roadmap. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be talking today, uh, and a lot of people are going to be talking today about life on Earth, but why do we care about life on Earth? We're looking for, like, life elsewhere. But really it has to do with we work with what we got kind of thing. So we uh, have this really beautiful complex system of life on Earth. And the better that we understand it, the better that we, we are able to um, know what to look for elsewhere in terms of biosignatures, in terms of um, you know, maybe what microbes look like, that sort of thing. Um, so that's essentially uh, why you're going to have a lot of people today talking about how life arose on Earth. This is the tree of life, and even this is a pretty simplified version. Um, so we are, uh, I mean, today, modern biology is kind of here, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that at all today, so these are all the interesting stuff. We're in here, um, plants, yeast, yeah. Not going to talk about any of that. Jennifer is going to talk about that right after me. Um, so I'm going to go back uh, here, actually, before here, three four billion years ago, depending on who you believe, and I'm not going to get into that argument, um, to the uh, last universal common ancestor, which is uh, essentially not necessarily one single cell that, from which all life on Earth uh, evolved from, but probably a population of, uh, of cells um, with really rapidly changing uh, or exchanging information, so, um, which is called uh, horizontal gene transfer today. Uh, so the idea there is that the information can go back and forth really quickly, and so things were happening very uh, fast until at some point, um, whether it was a physical barrier or something that came up between the, um, this uh, ancestor and the uh, ancestor of all bacteria, or something chemical, um, anyways, caused, caused the divergence. Uh, so, but, yeah, like I said, I'm not going to talk about any of that today. I'm going to basically try and get you from the origin of life, which is here, somewhere over here, maybe, to uh, the last universal common ancestor. So, um, one thing that is common, the one thing we look at when we're trying to figure out uh, the traits of the last universal common ancestor are things that are common to all of life today. This is the central dogma of molecular biology. This is why our bodies work. Um, and it's common to all life on Earth. So you have it, um, protists have it, everything. Uh, so the way that this works um, is that you have double-stranded DNA, which is our information storage, long-term storage. It gets uh, turned into RNA in a process called transcription, or copied into RNA in a process called transcription. Um, and then uh, RNA is sort of the short-term memory of life, and it carries uh, that information to a complex, which I'll talk about a bit, little bit later, which makes proteins. Proteins are what do the majority of the work in your body, um, you know, making all the molecules that you need to survive. So, yeah, because this is common to all life on Earth, we can probably say that it was pretty well established in the last universal common ancestor as well. But let's get a little bit um, more familiar with uh, these guys. Sorry. Oh, I should say, this happens sometimes if uh, you want to talk about viruses, but nobody's talking about viruses today, so I can ignore it. <laughs> um, where RNA gets transcribed back into DNA. Um, so yeah, let's get a little bit more familiar with um, life. Uh, life is based around um, polymers, uh, at least in terms of the molecules involved in um, that central dogma. So uh, DNA is a polymer of this big long word, deoxyribonucleotides. All that means is that you have uh, nucleotides that are attached to ribose sugars that uh, are missing an oxygen at one position. I'll show you the chemical structure of those in a minute. Um, proteins are polymers of amino acids. We've already heard a lot of people talk about amino acids and where they could have come from, whether they're um, stellar in origin or uh, earthbound in origin. Um, 
and then uh, starches, um, which are probably maybe a little bit later addition, but um, are still a biopolymer that uh, um, all of these are products of dehydration reactions. So the monomers lose a water, and then they um, form these long chain polymers. Uh, sounds easy, not really. Um, but in, so in terms of the full chemical structure, let's go for um, DNA and RNA first. Uh, so this is DNA, this is RNA. The only, uh, there's only two differences here. Um, let's see. First off, I'm going to say that uh, I want you to kind of consider these in sort of modular units today. So there's these backbones, uh, which are exactly what they uh, sound like. They connect all of the informational units to each other. They're made up of uh, repeating phosphate groups and ribose sugars. Ribose is a uh, um, five-carbon sugar. Uh, and... Um, so in the case of uh, DNA, there's no oxygen at this position. It's just a hydrogen. At this case, uh, position, you have an OH. So that's why this is a ribose sugar. This is a deoxyribose sugar. Um, these are the actual informational units that uh, make up our genetic code. Um, these are the short forms for all, uh, them. So adenine and guanine are uh, what are called purines, which have these two uh, rings, um, aromatic rings. And then you have... Uh, Cytosine, thymine, and uracil, which are these, just have the uh, one six-membered ring. <coughs> um, oh, and the other difference is that uh, thymine is a little bit different than uracil. Uh, thymine has a methyl group right here. Uracil does not. Uh, feel free to debate why. Um, so uh, the big questions in terms of origins of life were why were any of these components chosen? So why do we have a phosphate here? Why do we have a ribose here? And why are these bases th what they are? Um, and another big question is modern life uses only D sugars. I don't really want to get into stereochemistry, but uh, um, stereochemistry is basically molecules can have two different handednesses. Um, so uh, if you have uh, a molecule or a, an atom, a carbon atom that has four substitutions, it can either have one configuration this way, so my carbon atom's here, I can have uh, my three arranged this way, or, yeah, all right. Stereochemistry. Uh, we can talk about it later if you really want. Um, uh, so yeah, but basically, um, yeah, one of the big questions is why only D sugars? Um, into a little bit more detail. So this is a 3D structure of, uh, in this case, DNA. Um, but here you can actually see how the information is uh, transferred um, from the two different strands. I, mean, I told you DNA is double-stranded. So uh, th these are base pairing interactions where uh, they're uh, complementary. So thymine right here can base pair to adenine with uh, these two hydrogen bonds. So we have a, a donor and a acceptor, sorry. All right, I'm not a chemist, I'm a biochemist. Um, and then with uh, um, cytosine and guanine, you get three interactions, so it's a little bit stronger. Um, and then th because these are really nice planar molecules, they stack really nicely on top of each other, and that's also what causes the twist of the helix, is the way that the, that, uh, the bases prefer to stack on top of each other. Um, so that's why we have this really nice structure where you've got the bases all stacked on top of each other, and then along the outside here are the sugars and the phosphates. But one of the big questions, like I said, is why did we use these specific ones? And you're going to hear about um, some maybe alternate nuclear bases later today. Uh, so the ones that we actually use, these are only the purines, those larger ones. Uh, the ones that we actually use are uh, adenine and guanine. But uh, if you do like prebiotic chemistry, uh, in a lot of cases, you can get many of these, you know, from stuff like uh, uh, formamide reactions or HCN um, polymerization, that sort of thing. You can get hypoxanthine, you can get xanthine. So why did we end up with just these two uh, rather than any of the rest? Similarly, we can look at the amino acids, which are what makes up all the proteins in our body. Um, for starters, you can see there's obviously a lot more. Um, this might have to uh, or provide us with some hints as to why we use proteins for a lot of uh, the business in our uh, bodies now rather than um, nucleic acids because they're just a lot more chemically diverse so they can do more interesting chemistry. Um, so there's another question of which of these, so I guess is kind of the inverse of the nucleobases. You can't make all of these in uh, prebiotic reactions um, so in that case, why did we end up with some that are hard to make? Uh, why did we, there, there are ones that you can make 
that uh, didn't end up in life, so why didn't we end up with those ones? Uh, where they could have come from, they said, we've already had people that have talked about um, you know, stellar sources for uh, uh, amino acids. And um, similarly to uh, nucleic acids, life only uses L amino acids, uh, so it's the opposite um, kind of ice, uh, isomer. Um, so again, a good question for that is why that came about. Unfortunately, we don't have any of these. I would love it if we did, um, but uh, I, we'd all be out of jobs. Um, but because the laws of chemistry and the laws of physics have stayed the same over billions of years, luckily we can extrapolate and say, okay, maybe we can um, sort of resurrect these processes that happened billions of years ago, or at least some approximation of them. Um, and uh, also, we obviously need to know sort of what the environment was at the time, so we can get a lot of information about that from the geologic record, and I'm not going to talk about that because it's not my specialty, and you guys have heard about it for two days. Um, but a uh, really brief history of sort of prebiotic chemistry and some of the really iconic experiments in it. Um, I could give you an hour-long talk just on interesting prebiotic chemistry, uh, but um, this sort of gives you a historical overview as well. So this guy named Lobb, way back in 1913, made glycine, which uh, you've heard talked about. It's, it's the simplest amino acid, so it's pretty easy to make in the grand scheme of things. Um, so that's why you could do it 100 years ago. Uh, so all he did was pass an uh, electric discharge, um, simulating maybe lightning or something like that, through uh, carbon monoxide, ammonia, and water vapor. So really simple chemicals that give you a building block of life when you add energy to them. Um, this uh, guy named Bodish uh, made uracil, which is one of the uh, bases that's uh, found in RNA. Um, and in that case, uh, it was just urea. Again, really simple compounds. Malic acid is a very small, uh, um, very small acid. Um, with sulfuric acid, which some people believe uh, would, would have been around in um, prebiotic times as well. Uh, Oprin and Haldane were two theorists that uh, came up with a lot of the sort of general uh, theoretical framework of the uh, conditions on early Earth and how those could have led to life. Um, and uh, then Stanley Miller, you guys heard about yesterday, uh, who's responsible for the probably the most iconic um, prebiotic chemistry reaction in which you're uh, simulating volcanic lightning in, a, uh, um, in an atmosphere. And again, really simple compounds that give you a bunch of different amino acids. Uh, in some cases, ones that are in life, in some cases, ones that aren't. This is my view of prebiotic chemistry. Prebiotic chemistry's job is to get us from those really simple molecules um, that should have been available on early Earth to the building blocks of life and then ultimately to long chain polymers uh, that we, not necessarily of the lengths that we have today, but long enough that they can actually do interesting things um, without, uh, so I guess if you really want to get into sort of definitions of life, you could say that you're going, you know, from abiotic to a more biotic uh, synthesis of interesting molecules and stuff like that when you have some of these longer chain polymers. I'm not saying they need to look exactly like what we have today because for various reasons, some of those components aren't necessarily perfect uh, in terms of energetics, in terms of stability, stuff like that. But if we get to something that looks similar, then I would say prebiotic chemistry has done its job. Another thing that could help uh, prebiotic chemistry do its job, once you've got um, some of the more complex molecules, uh, there's this um, uh, idea called self-assembly, which is exactly what it sounds like. You put these molecules together, and then they self-assemble into long, um, long structures, the long complex structures. Um, this is kind of a way that you might be able to make uh, big stuff that looks like uh, RNA or DNA or proteins today, but without having them actually covalently bound to each other. So in this case, these are, um, uh, I mean, these do kind of look like purines in the middle here, and um, these uh, assemble mostly based on just the stacking interactions of these surfaces. So again, they're nice, like, flat molecules, and they can just stack on top of each other over and over and over until you get these really huge, long complexes that you can see with, like, light microscopes. Um, so once you've got long-chain polymers, you get into hypotheses about what came first, which is sort of a chicken-the-egg idea. There are people that believe that um, RNA came first, and I'm of that school because that's where I do my research in, but, um, and luckily we don't have, uh, I don't think any, uh, we might have a couple people that might uh, disagree with me, but um, there's also the idea that proteins came first or that metabolism came first, um, but I'm, the majority of the talks uh, that you guys are gonna hear about this sort of, we have some polymers but not really complex life, 
are going to deal with the RNA world. So the RNA world hypothesis states that early in evolution, again, we're still talking well before LUCA, uh, RNA served both informational and functional roles. So it carried the information, even though it's not as stable as DNA is, um, and it also um, carried out more functional, uh, the functional roles in terms of like making um, amino acids or, or making themselves, making, you know, making nucleobases, that sort of thing. Um, so eventually DNA replaced the archival informational role of uh, RNA, again, unless you're a virus, but I don't have to talk about viruses today. Um, so because DNA is a little bit more stable, so it's better for a long-term storage, think of it as your, heart, your body's hard drive. Um, rather, uh, and protein, like I said before, because the amino acids, the building blocks are more chemically um, varied, uh, that ended up replacing a lot of the functional roles of RNA because you can do more interesting chemistry with proteins than in most cases you can do with RNA. But RNA still serves um, both of the, these purposes today. So that's the real um, sort of uh, linchpin to the RNA world is that uh, there's RNA still carries information from one place to another uh, in the cell. Um, in all life on Earth, it serves as the short-term memory or the RAM uh, of life. And uh, the, um, uh, the ribosome, which is what makes all of life on Earth, so again, that's sort of a chicken and egg conundrum. You have, uh, the uh, ribosome's functional parts are mostly made of RNA. Um, so with that, you can't, have, you can't have protein without the thing that makes protein, which is made of RNA. So again, another pretty good piece of evidence that RNA uh, probably came first. And then uh, ribosomes, which are responsible for a lot of gene regulation, stuff like that, are uh, basically exactly what they sound like. They're um, RNA enzymes. Uh, and there's tons of those left over in life today, too. Why do we have time? All right. All right, so let's get back to the central dogma. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, uh, tran uh, this transition going from DNA to RNA, uh, but it's called transcription. It's um, performed mostly by protein enzymes. Uh, but I am going to talk about uh, translation, um, which is uh, exactly what it sounds like. It's translating the genetic code into functional proteins. Um, so what is responsible for that, like I just said, is the ribosome. It uh, reads the messenger RNA and uh, turns it into, um, through the, uh, these other functional RNAs, which are called transfer RNAs, which carry the amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, to the ribosome. Um, they uh, make, in a coded and sort of logical way, uh, this peptide chain, which will eventually become a protein. Um, I guess that's all I need to say about that for right now. I have grossly oversimplified things uh, for the purposes of time. This is um, actually a little bit more in depth uh, what the sort of informational network of life looks like, but I'm not going to get into it. We, again, we can talk about it later if you want. <laughs> Um, yeah, but essentially you need to know that DNA, as I said, still goes to functional and informational roles. Uh, both of those interact with proteins. And then these functional networks are stuff like metabolism, which is grossly complex. Um, but people are still going to try and explain to you today, and I do not envy them that. Um, so once you've got uh, proteins in life, proteins evolve in a very interesting way where um, it's not... In a lot of cases, uh, it's um, not you know, really small changes, uh, especially probably early in evolution. They evolve in modular ways. So rather than having just you, know, you change one building block here, one building block there, they're kind of like, um, uh, I can't really use Lego because that's building blocks. <laughs> um, but essentially um, big globular chunks of proteins that sort of interchange with each other uh, to give you um, different uh, functions and different uh, proteins. So proteins are really interesting in that they can combine functions. So if you know, there's two functions that are kind of related, at some point in evolution, in a lot of cases, they'll say, hey, let's get together and we'll do this as one protein rather than two. Um, so that's kind of what I'm getting at in terms of the uh, modular structure protein evolution. So in this case, you can see this uh, enzyme called GTP hydrolase. Um, both of these, by the way, are uh, ribosome-affiliated proteins. Uh, so you can see kind of the general structure. This is just a cartoon diagram that shows you the, um, not all of the side chains, but just the backbone conformations of the uh, protein. But you can see here that this looks really similar to this, which is also found um, associated with the ribosome. So you have these helices here, um, and uh, it has you know, its own separate domains as well. 
Um, yes, yeah, so enzymes today carry out uh, most of the uh, complex chemistry in the body um, through mechanisms like this, where you, I'm not an organic chemist either, but uh, you know, you're, you're shuttling electrons around. Um, and uh, yeah, so that is, this is just one of millions and millions and millions of proteins that are active in life today uh, in a network that looks something like this. Um, and again, <laughs> really complex, uh, not going to try and go into it too much, but there is somebody today that's going to try and go into this part of it at least. Uh, so this is the amino acid, amino acid uh, biosynthesis, um, which like I said, in uh, uh, prebiotic times, we uh, probably had to do this abiotically, but today we have uh, you know, tons of proteins that actually take over on this and make all the amino acids that uh, put together life today. At some point in all of this process, pre-LUCA, I'm not going to try and say when, you had to have an event um, where the, all these processes become uh, compartmentalized uh, so that it's basically when interesting things are happening, you don't want them to float away. You want them to stay nearby so that they can do more interesting things and stay near the other interesting uh, molecules. Um, so this is just a simple vision of um, what's called a protocell, which is a version of a cell that is just really basic uh, and that it only has like some really essential uh, like replication and a few um, um, metabolic uh, functions. So uh, yeah, so you can see just little tiny pieces of RNA in here that are encapsulated by like a lipid membrane, pretty similar to what we have today. Um, so that's another thing that uh, um, is pretty widely accepted to have happened before the last universal common ancestor. I think I'm getting to the end. Yeah, so um, in our history of evolution, this is basically what I've tried to drive home to you today, that uh, t you know, we had all these processes that got us up to the last uni universal common ancestor. People are going to help fill in those, some of those gaps today in their talks. But uh, that it was cellular, compartmentalized, uh, that it probably had a DNA genome because DNA is more stable than RNA, um, and the processes that uh, are involved in turning DNA into RNA uh, are very old. Um, we can tell based on the sequences of the proteins that um, they're similar enough in all of life that they probably came before life started branching off from each other. Uh, had a sophisticated translation system, so again, that, um, to get from the RNA to the protein and had a lot of genes, but nowhere near the number that we have today. Um, so in the takeaway for this morning, uh, I just want you guys to remember the central dogma of modern, modern molecular biology, and it did not hold true um, necessarily for uh, you know, millions or hundreds of millions of years um, in uh, pre-LUCA, um, where you go from DNA to RNA to functional protein. Um, Prebiotic chemistry has shown the feasibility of many, that you can make many of life's building blocks uh, with really simple compounds in uh, earlier, various um, different agreed upon early earth conditions. Um, protein enzymes now fulfill most of the functional roles in life, but RNA is still really important, and that is kind of the idea of uh, that it, uh, RNA is a molecular fossil sort of left over from the uh, RNA world. And uh, that um, the very, in a pretty simple way, the processes of, that are common to all of life on Earth were well established at the uh, time of the last universal common ancestor. With that, I will happily take any questions that you guys have. Wow, I'm thirsty. Nothing? Okay, Elena. Um, mainly because of the, the similarity of all life on Earth. There's so much, um, so many genes that have really similar sequences that just the probabilities that they, pro that they would have independently arose are just so small. Um, and not only in terms of sequences, but in terms of structure. So if you take the ribosome in particular, and I'm using this solely because it's what I work on, uh, there are parts um, structurally, if you overlay um, if you overlay uh, the uh, um, 3D structure, molecular structure, of an archaeal ribosome with a bacterial ribosome, there are parts at the core that, uh, are, that have moved fractions of an angstrom in billions and billions of years of evolution. So I'd say that's pretty good evidence that at some point they came from the same place. 
Um, that being said, like I said, LUCA is not one organism. It's um, you know a bunch of communal organisms kind of living in a very hippie commune way where they're all sharing stuff back and forth, um, you know, uh, so that they get to the point where uh, at some point something gets a bit, uh, yeah, so, and then at some point some opportunist says, I'm going off on my own, and that's when you start getting these branches in the tree of life. Hopefully that helped, kind of answers, yes, sir. So, does that mean that it's contamination, or could you build, is it possible to build a different ribosome? Oh, uh, so the question is if we did find life somewhere else on Earth that just happened to have ribosomes, uh, and if they looked very similar to uh, the ribosomes that we have on Earth, does that say that the ribosomes on Earth might have independently originated uh, rather than, I guess? Right, I mean, like, so in ribosome space, is there, are there other that is an excellent question. I mean, there's, uh, there's multiple people right now that are trying to, well, actually, yes. So um, there's somebody that has uh, made a very simple uh, uh, ribos uh, RNA-based system that is capable of transferring, um, making peptide bonds, which is essentially the job of the ribosome. Um, it's only about nine nucleotides, really small. With that case, it was selected artificially in a lab. Um, so, yeah, I think it's entirely possible that there could be another kind of ribosome. I would, I'm skeptical, I would say that if we found ribosomes that looked really like the ones on Earth, uh, I, I think that um, a ribosome could, uh, would probably independently arise somewhere else that was very different from what we have here. Um, I mean, the, the structural space that RNA is able to sample is just so massive. Um, you know, there's, um, yeah, there's just way too many different conformations that could, uh, that could form, and I, I'm sure that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of other conformations that could uh, make a ribosome. So ribosome is really interesting in that the way that it works today, it doesn't work like any other enzyme in life. Um, all, it's an entr entropy trap. It puts things in the right place so that the bonds can form. Uh, between the amino acids on those tRNAs. Um, it, it's very, I would say it's pretty arguable whether or not the uh, ribosome actually has any chemical uh, impact in that bond formation. Um, so, I mean, I think it's entirely possible that you could make a similar sort of entropy cage uh, out of maybe something that isn't even RNA. Yes? Anybody? <laughs> um, that's a, a really tough question. Uh, so the question is, is there a big energetic, or is there any energetic advantage uh, between the different isomers that life has chosen? Um, some people would say yes, some people would say no, some people would say if you can get a tiny, tiny enantiomeric excess of one in some prebiotic reaction or something like that, that would be enough to take hold and over millions or billions of years um, would, uh, you would get um, uh, yeah, you would get hom uh, homogeneous uh, isomer incorporation. And that's not to say that early in life we didn't have proteins that were made up of uh, D and L amino acids or, um, yeah, D and L uh, ribose uh, sugars or whatever sugars were originally um, in RNA. But the problem with that is that they wouldn't fold as regularly, and so there's a definite advantage, um, it, at least in terms of uh, uh, overall structure to having one isomer rather than both. Yes? So how complex is Luca? And is there an evolution? I mean, is it just that complexity of the first? Oh, yeah. I'd say evolution is well in place by the time of Luca. Um, selection, yeah, pressures, uh, for sure. Um, it might not be exactly how we recognize evolution today. But uh, there's the idea of one of the really sort of most 
simple things that you need to get in place to get from simple life to complex life are replicators. Um, so probably some small piece of RNA, well I say small, maybe 50 or 100 nucleotides or something like that, that's capable of making more of itself. That is a huge advantage in terms of evolution. You know, we, we talk about evolution in terms of like, I can run 1% faster than this guy kind of thing. That's like, you know, 10,000% uh, better performance and, and something like that is gonna stick around a lot longer and just, it, it's really, evolution in, uh, in early life comes down to persistence more than anything. How long you can stick around and uh, how much more you can make of yourself. That's my point of view at least. That is a very tough question. Um, yeah, one I don't think I have a really good answer for. It's, yeah, it's really tricky. If anybody has anything, feel free. <laughs> I'm a biochemist. <laughs> I, uh, all I know is that that's what we have now. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, so the question was um, if we did find life on Mars or elsewhere, uh, that also has um, D sugars and L amino acids, uh, if, we, if that would mean that we could say that life independently arose twice in the universe. And um, yeah, and I don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> And there is something to the fact that, I mean, the, the rules of chemistry are the same everywhere in the universe. I mean, there's different environmental factors and stuff like that you have to take into account, but um, so it depends on how much of it is chemical in origin uh, and how much of it is biotic in origin. How much of it is life that um, took hold and said, hey, let's just use these ones, and how much of it is, um, you know, a tendency to create abiotically more of one than the other. That's true. Yeah. But if you had the opposite kind of event, would that be poisonous or is that it, better? It, w it would, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be able to interact. You can't actually have the two hands interact through that, that self-assembly. It's more like a molecular mechanism. You wouldn't be able to have that. So there would be in two different sort of spheres where they wouldn't be able to uh, really interact with each other. Uh, so I, you would want to tend to go towards one that's going to be more fit, and that one I think would have been slightly stronger. So you're saying you throw yeah, I, I, I don't think that with the rules of chemistry um, that one candidate is going to be just better than the other one uh, just because uh, of some rule. I mean, they're, they're both, they, they both act the same way, but on two different inner chemistry sides. There are some people who think that um, stuff like stellar radiation and that sort of thing could influence one and the other, but I mean, that's, again, way out of my, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there are some people that think that the polarization, polarized light and the stellar radiation might be enough to cause small, tiny excesses in uh, one isomer or the other. So in that case, yeah, then maybe if, if something like that holds true and those excesses are enough that um, life takes hold of it and takes it to completion, then, uh, then yeah, perhaps uh, you could get similar life. Me too. <laughs> that's why we need those TARDISes. <laughs> All right, and then we can do one more question, then we've got to move on to Jen's. Jackie? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, I mean, and it, yeah, exactly. If there's one thing that is on the side of the formation of life, it's time. You know, we have tons of time to get stuff done. So you can make the slowest process in the lab ever, and as long as it, um, you know, still happens on a millions of year time scale, it's still feasible in terms of the origins of life. I think we got to keep going because. Jen also has about a half hour worth of uh, warm-up talk to give. If you guys want any break before you have to hear me talk again. <laughs>